You are now locked into Radio Juxtapos, the home of contemporary art and culture conversation. Coming up today. But I think a key part of this is also just kind of actionable goals and demands. It's not enough to say, oh, we stand in solidarity. I'm not interested in statements. I, I want to see behavior. This is Radio Juxtapos. Yes, yes, we're back in the mix. This is Radio Juxtapose, your regular dose of art therapy. Conversations and insight from all aspects of the art world by those that shape it. Shout out to everyone for listening to the last episode in Disrupting Capitalism with Manchester's Bill Posters. Got some really strong feedback from you guys on that one. If you missed it, be sure to go back, check that out. Or you can read his interview with Charlotte Pyatt in the summer 2020 print issue of Jux. That's right, baby. Print lives on. On today's episode, we're staying in the thread of disrupting systems as we're in conversation with the Bronx born and bred independent curator, Larry Ose Mensa. Together, we're going to follow the journey of a young graduate with a background in hospitality as he shows us how he broke into the scene through the back door and became a prominent staple on the international art circuit. Before we get into the interview with Larry, Evan and myself had something very important that we needed to catch up on. Enjoy the episode. So the question of the week, you ready for it? Oh, snap, here we go. Did Banksy have permission to go onto the underground and do that piece? Oh, I see, I didn't know if we were gonna dissect this or not. I'm happy we are. I think it's a good, it's a good thing to start because it was it, it was awesome. I loved it. It felt like fiery Banksy. Felt like I've spent the last like three years just watching one up paint on the outside of trains and he had gone on the inside and I was like, okay, that's how that's how you kinda go better. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know. You live in London. Is it can you do that without having like multiple what do they call the cops there? Bobbies? Bobbies. Oh, that is what we call them. We use that a lot. <laughs> I don't think that's been used since Mary Poppins. Yeah, okay, all right. (laughs) We got a couple of bobbies Um, on the beat. Look, the trains have been quiet, almost dead for the last four months. He looked bait walking in there in that hazmat with his hood up. (laughs) We still have terrorism here. (laughs) Is that the typical cleanup, cleanup crew uniform? Maybe that's where it was. Maybe it just kind of blagged that he was in to clean up a, a thing. It's like everything with Banksy. We're never really going to get an answer. Unless, no, no, no. unless you know, someone does a tell-all. It was, it was great. And uh, it's the first time I've heard the Chubba Wumba song in a long time. He was showing his age there. Or better yet, he was showing his fandom's age. Yeah, yeah, he exposed us all. We're all like, I get locked up, but I get up again. <laughs> uh, how's everything else going? Everything else is good, man. I, I, um, I'm just ticking along. Still, still here, still alive. Our, um, <laughs> that sounds so depressing. No, that's where I am. Just being alive is like, you know, hey, man. You're still yeah. here. You're doing something yeah. right. Um, I'm having a hard time keeping up with um, <laughs> where the fuck we are. Art. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> it. But like, our art show, our art shows open. Our museums open. Like, what? What does an appointment only mean? Uh, like, can you just show up and make an appointment? Like, I don't. It's confusing. And every state has like a different thing. Like, some museums are open in certain states, and some aren't. And I can't quite wrap my head around like what how our coverage is supposed to be but it's um i think it's going to be like that for like a year Mm. i think i think a a year is probably but there's so much the thing that's really frustrating is that there's so many good things that are happening in the art world in in the sense of um there were there were a lot of good shows this year and a lot of good artists that were having gonna have big solo shows and there were so many good things to look forward to that it's a bit of a bummer, but I guess, you know, 90% of people who see your show see it on the phone anyway. So I guess it doesn't change that much, I assume. It's just like the hard work that goes into these things is diminished a little bit. I think, especially for galleries. For galleries, yeah. it's like, where the, where, where's your place now in this? It was already kind of like in a position where galleries were having to reassess their model and their purpose in, in a world, you know, that's so reliant and heavily dependent on you know, Instagram as promotion. 
So, you know, what's to stop people just creating these virtual worlds themselves and just kind of just well, getting rid of the gallery yeah, model altogether? I think, that's, I think that gets to like what our guest Larry Men said today, you know, being a curator through this time and finding out how to still make shows special or how to kind of still create like really like good environments for the artists that he's curating and the shows that he's doing. Like it was, it's kind of nice that we got that angle for this podcast. Cause we hadn't really talked to a curator since the pandemic started. I was trying to think who the last uh, curator we talked to was, I guess, Andrew, uh, Andrew Edlin, I, I assume yeah. would have been the last one. Um, and that was interesting for lots of reasons too, but, um, this is just, I think, the mixture of the pandemic, social justice reform, what Larry's artists are doing for both causes that are good and just for the, the you know traditional museum shows. Like it was just good to kind of talk to a curator and like how they're sort of still active right now because I could easily see people getting discouraged and stopping and not wanting to do anything. So yeah, so we uh, today on the podcast we have Larry Mensa, uh, curator, um, found, co-founder of Art Noir, um, who's been doing just fabulous curation art shows. Um, now he's making his own art, which he tell which he told us about. In the yeah, podcast. I, I saw that um, on the on his Instagram. And I saw it on his Instagram went, too. He's um, releasing the yes. prints. That's so awesome. Um, so we speak to him today, just you know about all these things. You know, just how to stay. How to stay active during these times, like what's important to him as a curator and just like kind of something that we don't really get to hear about often, but just the daily life of somebody who's in the arts in kind of a different angle uh, and a different story than a painter or a street artist or um, people that we've talked to in the past. So it's it's revelatory, but also it's just kind of reassuring and it actually gave me a little bit more confidence to perhaps be a little bit more active uh, as well um, as we move forward through this sort of tumbling, dicey year. One thing I will say is like it's when I was putting this, even just when we were having this conversation, I was just kind of like mentally trying to check every single name that kind of comes up in this. There's a lot of, if you are on the hunt, oh, I know. if you're on the hunt for some new names, for some new artists to follow, this is this is the podcast for you because it is like there's there's a whole bunch in there so it's 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 really it's it's fun uh to talk to somebody who's got this much energy in the arts because sometimes doug and i need somebody with energy in the arts to get us (laughs) hyped so i think he i think i think larry did it so thank you yeah it's going until um hold on one second the sounds of new york um, so it's, it's, yeah, so the auction is still on. Um, so it's called, um, uh, from friends to friends. And, uh, basically the auction is providing seed capital to a, a micro grant fund that Art Noir is starting called a, a jar of love. And basically, um, the micro grant is being started in t- response to just what we were seeing with friends, colleagues who are impacted by COVID. And so it's specifically focusing on artists, curators, and cultural workers of color. Um, and it'll be live until July 8th at 5 p.m. on Artsy. Yeah, it's been great. I mean, all the artists who've participated, I think we have about 24, 25 artists. We have you know, some type of personal relationship, whether we've done a program, um, like a studio visit, we've been doing these virtual studio visits during quarantine, um, an in real life event. So it's good to kind of like basically engage artists in our community and um, collaborate in order to generate these funds that will further support other artists, cultural workers and curators. And so this is all done through Art Noir, which is a nonprofit 501c3 that I co-founded with some friends in uh, 2013. This thing comes, I get this question a lot as, you know, editor juxtaposed and and curating just for a magazine, but for, for a curator, an art curator going through the pandemic, what were some of the, what kind of like, what were some of the challenges early on for you during the pandemic? Like, okay, I'm an art curator. This being a curator is going to change a little bit right now. Like, how did you even think that you would have to adjust? 
you know, one, not being able to be in physical space. I'm one that's constant. I've been called peripatetic. <laughs> uh, so constantly working <laughs> on things. And so okay. learning to slow down. Um, like I had a show that was supposed to open in Rome in May that got pushed to the fall, November. But I think for me, I've been in the mindset for the last year or so in terms of thinking about ways to expand the practice, right? And I think because I come to curating more as an outsider, I'm self-taught, I didn't go to school for it, um, I'm not following a particular blueprint, right? So like, right. I've kind of cobbled together examples of curators that I admire. <laughs> <laughs> um, but most of the curators that um, I really kind of enjoy and respect, they, you know, operate on a different, a variety of different kind of um, trajectories, you know. And so, you know, one of the first things I did, you know, was just kind of just be quiet, <laughs> you know, and just kind of assess the situation. I think a lot of people were just scrambling to respond, to pivot, to create content. Um, we had this inundation of like digital content that really wasn't meant to be digital. And so kind of one of the first things I did in collaboration with one of my mentors, um, Troy Carter, who's a collector, entrepreneur, was do this thing called the Parlor series. And so he had been doing these check-ins in the music industry because he used to manage Lady Gaga. He has a record label, you know, he's, music industry legend and i kind of like the informality of that mm -hmm. and really just dealing with the humanity of the situation so we did a couple of them with artists collectors curators and really just take a temperature of how people are doing this whole time has kind of reminded me of why i do this and a lot of it is as much as it is about the art it's about the people and it's about the relationships you build over time you know, the first parlor we did was with um, Aaron Cristoval, Arthur Lewis, Hank Willis Thomas, and uh, Joanna um, from Jack Shaman. And Joanna and Hank I've known over 10 years, right? And, like, you know, it's, it's part of, like, maturing as an adult. You don't really think about a relationship that you're going to have for 10 years. Right. You know, and what happens and how we all kind of evolve but still – have maintained um, an incredible relationship. So I think stepping back, assessing the situation, taking the temperature of my friends and colleagues, just making sure they're good. But I think it was also, um, I got a lot of feedback from people that they just, it was nourishing to know that they're not the only ones going through this, right? Um, whatever that is. Um, we did a really great one um, that featured Ebony Patterson uh, because a lot of the rhetoric that was coming out is that artists are going to make some of the best work ever because they're like quarantine. And she was like, <laughs> right. nah, you know, you're dealing with the anxiety. Mm. You know, she's someone who, who lives between um, Chicago and Jamaica and, and not being able to go to Jamaica and see family. And so it was nice to just hear that articulated in the world. A right. lot of times these are things that are articulated in private conversation. Um, and then I think in terms of Art Noir, we just began to think about how can we be of service to our community. So we started doing these, you know, 30 minute virtual studio visits because some people were working from home. Some people still were able to get access to their studios and just use that as a tool for education, but then also to create awareness and making sure that it wasn't just artists in New York, so it was artists from LA, like Shanique Smith and Patrick Martinez in Atlanta, like Alfa Conti. Yeah. We had uh, Curtis Santiago, who's currently in Munich. The next steps is always about like, how can you be of service, right? And how can you educate, entertain, and hopefully enlighten folks? Um, and then I did a project with Showfields, which is, um, it's a retail platform, I guess, for creatives. Mm -hmm. And so I did and like an online thing of emerging artists and 20% of the money went to Black Lives Matter. Um, 
because that was just right after George Floyd's um, murder. And so, and it just didn't feel appropriate to just do this sale and say, hey, buy art, you know? Yeah, and right. so I think now a lot of the things that I'm doing, I'm trying to just, you know, continue to just be mindful, aware, sensitive um, to the situation and people's circumstances. I mean, even myself, like I have been cooking a lot during quarantine and uh, I, I launched this, um, I was calling it like my bachelor cooking series. <laughs> and uh, it actually stemmed from a friend. I think I was like making hot dogs or something. And she was like, I am scared for you. If this is how you're going to survive. <laughs> and I felt some kind of way about it. And so it just kind of motivated me, you know, started making bread like everybody else. And, you know, really just, you know, I found cooking to be cathartic, you know, because, um, you know, I study hospitality management and marketing in grad school. So I have a certain level of exposure to this. And then my cousin, Eric Ajapong, is on Top Chef. He was just on the All-Star season. So I sent him a random text message about, hey, this thing is not cooking properly. Your hot dog? Yeah, you didn't tell him about the hot dog, right? You gave him some... Yeah, it was the bread, right? Is this, is this the color it's meant to be? I don't know. I can't tell if this is done yet. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, the good thing is that like, it also, just on a human level... It just reminded me of the importance of self-sufficiency, right? One. Um, two, you realize, you know, particularly within the art world, so much of this is like human contact, going to openings, dinners, traveling to see shows, and really kind of stepping back and really trying to analyze what is essential. Even when restaurants open back up, I don't know how inclined I'm going to be to want to go to a restaurant, yeah. right? I've actually yeah. found joy now that we've opened up a little bit to like go to a friend's house and bring a loaf of bread or like uh, one of my co-founders, we discovered zucchini flowers and they've been doing like um, flower blossoms. And that's just something that we're kind of just sharing these experiences together. Uh, but from all of that, I, I, um, I turned 40 June 15 and I launched. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> Which will probably be a series of prints. So essentially I was using parchment paper to like cook stuff and it was leaving these impressions, these kind of abstract gestures. And I showed it to some painters and they were like, Oh, you should make a print of that. And Kate Shepard, who's an incredible artist based in Brooklyn. Um, she's like, I'm going to introduce you to somebody. And like, you know, most people it's lip service and like literally two minutes later, she's sending an email introducing me to Ali at Pegasus prints. And so we produced this print. It's called Parchment 40. And for me, it's more creative expression. Like, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be an artist. But 20% of the proceeds from the sale of these prints, we did an addition of 50, uh, will go to Summer, Summer Everything Art Center, which is Lauren Halsey's new project. They've been doing an organic food box in Watts and South Central. Yeah, she actually influenced us in doing the uh, juxtapose in doing the uh, fund fundraisers for Black Earth Farms in the Bay Area. Yeah, she was very influential in us deciding to do that. Yeah, so we're doing that, and then um, the CoFeed, which is an organization I think based in New York. And so I think just looking at the climate uh, as a curator, you also kind of recognize how can you create space and platforms for conversations, for experiences, and that is not solely about making shows in white cubes, right. Right? right? And so, so much of my practice has been about creating space for dialogue, for intersection, and, you know, through cooking and having to, like, go to the market every week. And, like, I live in the Bronx. I grew up in the Bronx. Like, I'm embedded in this and recognizing you know, the quality of produce or the lack of quality of produce. And now, you know, just gently just trying to like educate myself on the space and who are the advocates and how can I like collaborate with those advocates to bring them to my network that might not be thinking about these in general, you know? So like um, John Gray from Ghetto Gastro, we did a conversation um, a couple weeks ago, 
you know, talking about these issues of like food justice, food sovereignty. It's only been four months, but it feels like it's been four years. Oh, absolutely. But you know what you're getting at? And I think what's really fascinating here, and this might be one of the issues the art world has as a whole. A lot of things that you're talking about is in informality and impromptu decisions. And the art world does not do informality or impromptu de- decisions well. But a younger generation of us, especially like what you're doing, what Juxpo's, like we're not really constantly in that contemporary art world discussion all the time. We can make impromptu and, and informal decisions. But like, is that something that like you've noticed that the art world has a real struggle with? Yeah, I mean, I think... It's part of the foundation of the structure, right? You know, because this is a structure that was designed to be, you know, and this is historic. There's like, it's fact. It's not assumption designed to be for the elite. Wasn't designed to be for the average citizen, for lack of a better phrase. I mean, there's a book I read, Rogue Rogue Galleries, that gives you, that talks about the history of the Met. And like, you know, something as simple as banners announcing the shows you know, and I'm kind of shocked because it's not one of my favorite people, but this is something that Robert Moses made the Met do, you know, in an effort to make it accessible because the Met's on park land. Yeah. Okay. Right. And so I think it's also kind of indicative of just organizational structure. So I won't just relegate it to the art world. I think it's any industry where you have organizations, you have structures, you have processes, It becomes calcified. They lose this ability to be nimble, uh, to be human, uh, because you're trying to just like maintain some protocol. Um, And a lot of times you're just not applying common sense. Um, A lot of these institutions are led by boards. The level of activity on the boards are different for every museum. You have some museums that have board members that are super active, super vocal, know what's going on. You have others that have been siloed by executive directors, so they don't know what's happening on the ground. Um, And then you have some who, you know, are part of these organizations as a social exercise, so not really interested in being an agent for social change. Mm -hmm. And so I think for me, I've benefited in that I've been able to see a lot of different, see the art world from a lot of different perspectives, right? So, you know, first as a photographer, um, then as a writer, then as a curator, but then also simultaneously being part of museum groups. So, you know, I was part of the Young Collectors at the Guggenheim. I was part of Friends of Education at the MoMA. So kind of seeing it from that side as a patron, what are the pain points? Um, and so I think it's been helpful for me. And then also, you know, then working at a museum at MoCat, um, I've been able to see it from different points of view. And it's allowed me to become a little bit more efficient in how I work, but then also hopefully be a, a better resource to colleagues who are working in these calcified systems and are trying to figure out how to, you know, you have this whole like NOMA, dismantle NOMA you know, or um, as of moments had their issues. I mean, yeah. all these organizations are being called out, you know, and I think we're at an inflection point where people are just not going to look the other way um, mm-hmm. as if historically done. Um, but I think conversely, and I think that's also kind of the beauty of the of artists to kind of help us guide, guide us. Um, they're usually the ones who are going to keep us honest um and challenge us to be better but i think a key part of this is also just kind of actionable goals and demands it's not enough to say oh we stand in solidarity like Mm -hmm. i'm not interested in statements i want to see behavior who's led the charge for you then in in terms of behavior i still haven't seen it on the institutional level if i'm being honest Hmm. and and if if you haven't seen an example of what you would like to be shown or something that looks like leadership, what would leadership and action look like for you? So I would say colleagues have done some really interesting stuff. So Meg only, I always butcher her last name. 
Uh, Meg is at ICA Philly. Um, she did a couple of print projects with different artists, and that money was to support the Philly Bail Fund. And they mm -hmm. raised like a significant amount of money. It was quick and dirty, but super transparent. Mm -hmm. Right. So she, you know, they kind of said, you know, this is what we're doing. This is what's available. Once it's sold, this is how much we made. They gave a financial breakdown. And so I think just that act of transparency, I think is something that we need more of. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like when you're donating, even with us, it's like when you're donating money to something, you know, you're donating to a cause, you feel good, but you really don't know how that money is breaking down. Yeah. Right. Yeah. How much of that is going to go to go, go to overhead, you know, and I've seen many a case where like, you know, people have robbed Peter to pay Paul and move money around and not giving it to the thing that it needs to go to. Um, so I think transparency is one thing. I think another thing is just kind of recognition of being complicit to a lot of these, um, to systematic oppression, um, mm -hmm. to microaggressions, to gaslighting, to um, creating environments where people feel marginalized and ostracized. You know, there's been a lot of discussion around the need for diversity, which I think is important. But I think, you know, what does it look like to also put tools in place to, you know, do diversity and inclusion training, do anti-racism training, mm -hmm. all the things. That, and, and that should be from board to staff, everybody, right? And then putting some actionable goals in place because like, it's not enough to say, okay, we're going to make our staff 20% POC. You know, what kind of support right. are you putting in place for them to thrive? And that's, again, an organizational corporate museum issue. Right. Where right. it's like you bring in PLCs, but you don't give them the tools to kind of navigate a culture that they're not familiar with. I know some corporations, you might get like an advocate or a mentor, you know, so is that some a process that could be put in place where like you as a junior staff member or even a senior staff member have some type of advocate or mentor that you can go to? And I think the challenge is that museums are at varying scale. You know, so you have some that are like the Met, which is like a small city. And then you have others that are like a staff of 10 people. And you have like someone who's HR, finance and development. What can be done within reason to make sure that, you know, certain burdens aren't put on one person as they're also trying to manage other tasks. I think the other component is more federal funding. I mean, when you look at, the stimulus bill, from my understanding, only two hundred and fifty million was allocated to the arts out of two trillion. I believe Obama had upped it, and then Trump brought it back down to busy even before all this stuff in terms of the funding of the arts. I believe, mm -hmm. yeah. And and so then now you have you know a multitude of organizations who are fighting for the same pool of money, and obviously the bigger names, mm -hmm. the ones with more clout, are going to have mm -hmm. access. It's just like the PPP. So if you look at how the PPP works. Like, if you had a great relationship with your bank, it was smooth sailing. Yeah, yeah. If you, if you didn't, or you were a small business or a minority-owned business, there's people who still probably haven't. That's why they had to extend. Well, partly, how did they had to extend it. Yeah, I think, you know, transparency, admission of complicity, complicit, complicity, clear steps towards equity, inclusion, paradigm shift through training, making sure that monetary resources are put in place so these things can be done. Mm -hmm. I mean, a whole other kind of thread is like payment just mm -hmm. in terms of salary, because like if you're a curator working at an institution and if you look at the wage numbers, you're not getting paid a lot of money. Absolutely not. No. Yeah. You're, you're totally right. Yep. COVID has revealed the fragility of the financial structures of a lot of these institutions and how like you know you saw a contraction very quickly and it was like not even a month right and so for me it's like oh do they know something i don't know furloughing people you know it, it, it creates a lot of questioning in terms of is this what i should be doing with my life because a lot of people do this because they love it mm -hmm. not to get rich 
but for me, it's like inviting people to take more of an entrepreneurial approach within their practice as artists and as curators to identify multiple streams of income and just make sure that, you know, you're fiscally sustainable. Cause this is something that I talked to a lot of artists about in particular is like, like I was actually yesterday, like I did um, some virtual studio visits with like students at RISD. And like one guy was like, Oh, I'm, I'm freelancing. And I'm just like, look, there's no shame in it. You got to make sure you got food on the table and you're paying your rent. You know, and there are many artists, superstar artists who will tell you they worked at The Gap or they worked as a waitress as they just try to find balance within their practice. And so I think, you know, doing things that allow for fiscal sustainability and allow you to just kind of do what you love and enjoy has always been paramount. Yeah, and I I think that's an interesting thing you're talking about too because I feel like a lot of kids that I talk to, um, unfortunately, when they're, knee deep in grad school for painting or for the arts. There's always a couple kids in their class that come from a really wealthy family and they're not needing to hustle as much. And so there is this, pre- there is this pressure kind of built up of like, wait, I don't, if I freelance or if I do something else, I'm not, I'm falling behind these other people who have like, like just all the time in the world. Yeah. All the time in the world. And I feel like that's one of the, that's a, a real pressure and, in, in in painting grad school that I see. Yeah, I mean, but I think it's a trick bag, right? So it's like Simon Sinek has this book and there's another author with a similar book and me and Hank Willis Thomas talk about it, you know, all the time, the difference between an infinite mindset and a finite mindset, right? Mm -hmm. And so like, when you're just thinking purely of being in competition with someone else, that's more finite. I tell artists, you know, if you're truly in this, this is a marathon and this is your life, right? And so, you know, there will be moments where there'll be ebbs and that's real. And I got friends who like were covering of the art section, New York times who like had a moment where they were on the side of a milk carton because that's just kind of what it is. That's why it's important to really kind of evaluate why you do this. Right. One, but then I think too, and I'm, I'm seeing it with certain programs particularly because COVID forced a lot of programs to go to online learning, um, students really pushing and being advocates for themselves because like, I think some programs might continue it in the fall. Mm-hmm. And it's yes. like, how are you a studio or MFA candidate and you can't get in the studio? Yeah. You know, and obviously that's for health and protection, but it's like, all right, we need to augment how much you're charging or something. And so, you know, I always impress upon artists to just be advocates for themselves, make sure they're getting the resources they need, the education they need, you know, because the constant thing I get is that, oh, you know, I'm graduating, a lot of galleries are hitting me up to do shows, and I have no idea how to handle it. And it's just kind of like, to me, it doesn't make sense because, like, you wouldn't hear that from an MBA student or a law student, you know, so why are MFA students not being given the tools to survive? Right. Yeah. And I've, you know, I've had a number of discussions of different heads of programs and they feel like it's prescriptive and it should be about the art. I mean, I also have like professors and colleagues who are super purists about it. And I'm like, I get that, you know, but like, you're also putting these students in a position to be prey. Right. Because it's like, if they don't understand the basics of like a consignment agreement, I mean, if I told you the amount of times that artists have like, put works in shows and have not done a consignment agreement, you'd be like, yeah, you know, you'd be a like simple, 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 basic stuff. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. And I think that should just be part of the curriculum is just like simple kind of business one-on-one taxes, how to, you know, buy materials, grant writing, just basic stuff. So people can survive. Right. Because it's just like, But again, this comes back to the structure where the structure probably is not really um, thinking about your survival as like a primary thing. Um, And then what happens is you get this kind of imbalance where people are going to certain programs, more attention is put on those programs. And I mean, there are hundreds of programs across the country with super talented artists, you know. But also think about like when I first came into the art world, the MFA was really like, your key to 
teaching. So you literally went to school, got an MFA, and then you taught. And you made art. And then maybe you got a little bit of traction. And so I've seen that shift within the last 10 years. And for me, it's important for artists to just have options. What was your entry into this, uh, particularly with focus on the curation? And when you came in, did you feel you, you said you were an outsider? Uh, in what respect? Um, so for me, it was through photography. Uh, I did my grad school in Switzerland and... and, and uh, I started basically documenting my experience with people that I was growing up with in the Bronx. And I did my first show as a photographer with a good friend of mine, Stanley Lumax. It was in the back of like a boutique shop, Harrods Harrods Alter Ego, which no longer exists in Brooklyn on Flatbush Avenue. Mm -hmm. So like my entry was like non-traditional community space it wasn't like a gallery in chelsea what was that like collective like was it you and a bunch of friends peers people you were studying with so it was me uh my friend stan um and gozi odita who was the owner of the store layla uh, who's also a photographer and um you know it was just community it was like we got this space we want to show art and it wasn't about the art world it was about creative expression Mm -hmm. it was about seeing reflections of self very far from this kind of like art world discourse. But I saw the power of creative expression and galvanizing community. And that's kind of been foundational in how I work Um, and making it accessible to as many people as possible because my first experience was not in a traditional gallery setting. And then over time, I just kind of realized like being a photographer, the the, the pressure, I just wasn't interested in it. Um, But I recognize, you know, through meeting artists, joining museum groups, educating myself, you know, this is like 2009, 2010. um, There was a lack of platforms, exhibitions for artists of color, Mm -hmm. young artists of color. And so just started doing shows and just learning by doing, had some great mentors. I mean, Derek Adams was an early mentor and supporter of mine. Um, Danny Simmons, Rush Arts family. Um, and then, you know, becoming friends and learning from artists like Kehinde Wiley and Micheline Thomas and Rashid Johnson and Titus Kafar and, you know, so many other artists and just kind of watching how they moved and then learning from that in terms of, okay, this is how you're supposed to conduct yourself as a professional artist. You know, this is what an exhibition is supposed to look like as a professional artist. And then kind of using that as like a blueprint of sorts in terms of how I approach shows. You know, just kind of recognizing that there was a need. Was there an element of seeing, being shown, as an outsider, being shown this is what an exhibition is supposed to look like? Was there a pressure to be like, okay, cool, well, if that's what an exhibition is supposed to look like, well, I'll make mine look the same? Or was it like... These are the rules. This is how you break them. I think it's more the latter, you know, because I never had someone say, I mean, I've read and done research, but I've never had some, I can't say I've really had a conversation with someone about like, this is how an exhibition is supposed to look. Because the other thing that's important to highlight, you know, my background before art is, you know, it's marketing, it's advertising. So I'm thinking about packaging this thing, you know, and telling you a story. That shifts my approach because I'm thinking about what the PR is going to be, the press release, the rollout. That informs simple things as like what's going to be, you know, the cover image, you know, design. And so, you know, I kind of just use that experience from working in media marketing and advertising and apply that to like exhibitions and like, okay, what's going to get the most attention? Um, What's going to get people excited? What's going to get the press interested? And, you know, having worked with press as a writer, I know what would have, you know, got me excited to want to write about a show. You know, I think coming from the outside, you have a naivete. So you don't know what's right or what's wrong. You're just doing it. Right. And you're just basically A, B testing. Is the show successful or not? And then over time, as you get reps and you get feedback, I've been lucky to have, like, mentors who are artists, mentors who are collectors, mentors who are curators 
who would give me feedback and, you know, help me figure out ways to kind of refine and tighten my presentation, you know, tighten the journey. But I think also like the hospitality education that I have informs the approach because, you know, so much of like working in a hotel or working in a restaurant is about creating this holistic experience in this journey, in this memory. And so right. I'm thinking about how do you do that in an exhibition? Because I know that the gallery assistant who's at the front desk is that's the maitre d'. And if they fuck up the experience, then the whole thing is no good. I mean, if you walk if you walk through Chelsea on a Saturday afternoon, the girls in the front of a gallery or or men, whatever, boy, if sometimes if they're like rude to you, you're like, this is this whole show is not going to be good for me anymore. I've learned to ignore it. Okay. And not really care. Yeah. Because it's like. I know, because it's their job. They don't want to. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I know, but I, but I do get what you're saying. Like, there, there's a presentation that it, it goes, goes all, all the way, way through. through. Yeah, I mean, I w- one thing I do tell artists because artists all the time are like, "Hey, I want a gallery. I need a dealer," you know. And I'm like, "Okay." I used to teach this class um, with a buddy of mine, um, Amani Olu, called the rules. And one of the assignments we gave them was like, "Okay, write down your top five galleries." go to these galleries and see what your experience is and write about it. And so Uh when they talked about the gallery attendant not being responsive, being rude, not answering questions, this intimidating environment, and then they say, okay, you've acknowledged all these different emotions. Now, is that still a place you want to work with? Because if your work is in there, that's the experience they're creating for someone else. Mm -hmm. And so I think you're definitely like, the climate is changing and I think people are, have been a lot more vocal about that behavior. And I think also for me, it's like, depending on the gallery, you know, there definitely been times where I've flexed where like, (laughs) you know, the gallery person attendant is like, just hasn't been nice or accommodating or helpful. And then it's just like, Oh, it's such and such here, the owner of the gallery or the director. And then it's just kind of like the whole energy shifts. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, it's like that pretty woman moment. Yeah. But the thing <laughs> is that when I do have those moments, I also tell, I also tell, you know, my friend or colleague at the, at the, at the gallery, like, yo, what's up? This person is not being warm or accommodating or like didn't lift their head up when I came through the door. Yeah. Like, that's a bad look. That's kind of the odd thing about the art world is that you build these really interesting relationships with people that outside of the art world, you probably would not be friends with, Mm. you know, but art becomes this glue. And, and, you know, I've built some really incredible, meaningful, lifelong relationships. And so, you know, it gives me the comfort to be like, this is not cool. Depending on the scenario, I definitely try to be more vocal about it. Uh, because these are not behaviors you want people to adopt and take with them moving on in their career. And I think it also kind of just builds on this elitist exclusionary attitude, potentially omitting a large segment of people who want to be part of this ecosystem. As much as COVID has shown the fragility of museums, it's also shown the fragility of galleries. You know, but then I think sometimes that behavior is indicative of the culture of the organization, right? Mm -hmm. So I've seen situations where, like, that attendant is reflective of the owner of the gallery. It's not by accident. Yeah, exactly. And so now you have dealers who are in a pinch who are now trying to come back around for support or insight. And it's just kind of like, well, you treated everybody like shit. Why should I help you? Right, exactly. Why should I buy a painting from you now when you've been, you know, I, yeah, I, I think that's. Did you ever feel a reluctance to join this model in a model where you didn't see representation kind of existing? Did you not was when you did your first show, it was community and it was you doing what you hadn't seen in other spaces. Was there kind of like uh, an element where you're like, well, we could just kind of keep doing this rather than trying to absorb into this? No, you definitely have moments where people, you know, you, you go to the party and the small talk and people are trying to qualify you. And it's like, oh, what do you do? And you're like, oh, I'm a curator. And then it's just like, you know, you get peppered with a lot of stupid questions. <laughs> I want to hear what, what's a stupid question. Come on. Normally, the first question is, are you an artist? Of course. Yeah. It's not even what do you do, which 
I would appreciate that more than, oh, are you the artist or are you an artist? And it's kind of just like this presumptive behavior. I wouldn't say it's stupid, but it's just a line of questioning just seems like condescending. You can see their, you can see their train of thought almost. You can see where they're kind of going and it's maybe like revealing a little more. Yeah, and it doesn't come from a place of interest. Mm. It's more like, you know, anybody who spent time in L.A., I won't say this for all L.A. people, but, you know, you do have that moment where it's just like, oh, can this person help me? As opposed mm. to who is this person? No, that's L.A. <laughs> I don't think anyone's disagreeing with you. Though. But once I realized that was like a trick, then I just kind of stopped answering the questions. Or I knew what to answer with to get them to kind of shut up. You know, again, because I didn't have a concrete model outside of like, you know, someone who I greatly admire in Okunwi Weza, you know, who's poet, writer, and develops this incredible curatorial practice. There's only a handful of examples. I recognize the situation. Part of the goal was to kind of infiltrate the system. People were either going to get down with the program or they were going to get run over. These artists had something to say. It was less about me and more about these artists having something to say. These artists deserve to have not only the platform, but the resources to kind of exhibit and execute at the highest level. In terms of curators, how many other uh, curators of color had you seen in your early days of doing this? And was the answer to that potentially why you wanted to come in and t take that role? I mean, that's part of it. I mean, I think someone like Franklin Sermons has been super supportive. Director at PAM, Thelma Golden has been super supportive. Rahima Barber, who's at Kalamazoo. Yeah, I mean, I've had the opportunity to have a conversation with a lot of the people who are considered kind of iconic curators of color. Um, and some I've had been able to build like, you know, significant rapport. But yeah, I think for me, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a doer by nature. So when I don't see something that isn't reflective of me or I don't see something that gets me excited. I'm going to figure out what it is that I can do to kind of put those things in place. Right. So like as a young man in my twenties and like, I didn't see certain events or groups organizing and congregating. So I was like, all right, I'm going to put my own thing together. And I think that's also kind of like the impetus for Art Noir where like, I didn't really see an organization that was catering to young professionals of color with the mission of supporting artists of color in the visual arts, performative arts, literary arts, and making these experiences feel accessible, but also making them feel safe, where like you can ask a question and not be intimidated to think it's it's a stupid question, for example. You know, and it's just one of these things where like now I kind of recognize over a decade in that, you know, the work that I do other young curators see that and they, and not even curators, artists, writers, and they're inspired by it, you know? So it forces me to be mindful of what I'm doing. Was there a moment for you where you realized that, that you're, what you were doing was potentially influencing other people of coming into a gallery? I mean, Instagram has been a great tool for that. I'll never yeah. forget. I was at Venice Biennale, I think 2015 and like some random dude stops me and then, and I'm like trying to, and he could see in my mind, I'm trying to... <laughs> You're like, I don't know who you... And he's like, oh, you don't, you don't know me, but I follow you on Instagram. I love what you do. And so when you have moments like that, you know, because it's like, they don't have to do that. That's affirming the amount of artists that have been able to kind of just be part of their journey, whether it's, you know, helping them put on their first solo show or writing an essay for them or helping them sell work to some collectors. For all of that, all of that is nourishing for me, right? So it's like... You can see these kind of tangible results, but I'm always conscious that it's not about me. It's about the work, right? It's about the artists. Um, it's about helping other people, you know, get one step, step closer to self-actualization. I'm already blessed to be able to do this as a profession, you know, but again, I'm conscious that like the things that I say or people that I champion that people will pay attention to and it right. can be a trigger. And some mindful of that but yeah i try to make it about the work make it about the artists my colleagues i try not to make it about myself as much as i can because people are just looking for things that are affirming things that are motivating 
things that are inspiring. And so just trying to do my part to just put that out in the world. You talk to so many young artists and you are around a lot of emerging artists, but like in the last couple of years, there's been some like really phenomenal shows, maybe potentially groundbreaking when we look back 20 years from now, uh, shows and artists who have merged the last couple of years. I mean, so much like there's so much Kende Wiley has like just by being in so many booths and major art fairs or Nathaniel Mary Quinn getting picked up by Gagosian. And then, you know, you th- Carrie James Marshall's mastery show is kind of like, to me was like just a pivotal moment for so much of just American painting in general. Um, but like, who are some of like, and it, it, this doesn't even mention Carrie Mae Weems and Carrie Walker and all these great people who like are the kids really, really looking up to these days that you speak to? Like who are some of like the foundational artists that just, seem to capture everybody's imagination. Micheline, Micheline yeah. Thomas, yeah. Carol Walker. I love what Diasa Gates is doing, not only as an artist, but as an urban planner. I'm um, in Chicago. Uh, Mark Bradford. I didn't even mention um, Mark Bradford. He's amazing. Yeah. Um, I think Jack Whitten. Carrie Mae Williams, definitely. As an Actually, artist, I... but then and also as an art producer, because the symposium she did at the Park Avenue Armory was groundbreaking, and she's so regal but precise. Yeah. So she's a no bullshit person. Yeah, I heard her speak recently, and she was so good. But I got that feeling she was definitely regal and just like she could talk all day, and I would listen. Zawu Bay, Yiko Shonabari. I mean, you, you see it, or Julie Moretto, like you see these artists because like you now you're starting to see the proliferation. I mean, it's not a new thing. I yeah. think it's probably new so more so with artists of color, them taking resources to create space for other people. You mm-hmm. know, so can they with Black Rock, Mark Bradford with art in practice. But I think what's been cool is to see artists that I've gotten to know over the last 10 years have an influence. So like somebody like a Lynette Yadam watching, you know, to visit MFA painters and be like, yo, you're painting like Lynette. Stop it. <laughs> and so it's kind of cool because like you've watched these artists' practices evolve over time. I think someone like Glenn Kino, you know, who I've had the pleasure to work with, Khalil Joseph, Arta Jaffa. I think Lauren, Lauren Halsey, what she's doing in LA, you yeah. know, not only as an artist, but like working in her community but then creating a space for them. You know, Noah Davis in the Underground Museum, um, Amy, Cheryl, um, like the show she did at Hauser, like there's one painting, the green painting of the gentleman on like the cross beam. Like that's, a, if I were a painter, I, I'd go back to the books, <laughs> yeah. right? <laughs> you know? Cause she just got everything right with that. I think one of the things that uh, it's becoming so apparent in what you're saying. It's just like, it's regardless of pandemics, it's, there's a lot of great art being made these days. Yeah. And so I think for me, that's the satisfying part of this, you know, cause I always tell people like collectors, there's always going to be another artist because people freak out when they like miss their chance, you know, from a collecting standpoint, but I guess also curatorially, I always get excited getting in on the ground floor. Literally when the artist is just like, the idea is just a scrambled egg. Right. You know, and to watch it kind of come into focus. But for me, it's like, what's the art that's going to cut through, right? What's the art that, for me, has soul and vibration, you know, particularly when we talk about, like, painting. It's not enough to be technically proficient. I mean, obviously, you need to be able to paint, but I'm not really focused on that. What are you looking for, then, as a curator? I'm looking for something with some soul. Makes me feel something. Something that's shocking, makes me uncomfortable. I mean... Like an artist like Christopher Wool, who like I've never been a super fan of, but when he did the show at the Guggenheim and Catherine Britson broke it down, I was like, shit, okay, respect. You know, because <laughs> you have to factor he's doing this in the eighties when everybody yeah. else is doing something totally different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so for me, that's a note in my mind in terms of like, all right, who is like going the who's going left when everybody's going right? Who have you passed on that suddenly come back and you've been like, shit, yeah. that was the they were they were doing something that I didn't catch at the time. I don't know. <laughs> that means he doesn't want to admit. I guess the person sits in the inner reaches of my mind because um, he never wanted to be wrong wanted... as a curator. Oh, he, he there's definitely one. He just doesn't want to say it. Yeah, I don't recollect. <laughs> <laughs> so going back to what I'm, you said, well, you asking what I'm looking for. I 
I want, you know, and this might sound hokey, kind of like a spiritual kind of triggering, you know, because there are a lot of artists I like and, you know, I could sometimes articulate why I like it. Other times, you know, that probably won't reveal itself for years down the line, but it's like, I know the voice feels fresh. I know the voice feels unique. The perspective feels unique. The hand feels different. I'm also looking for hand. If you're a photographer, how are you composing the image, sculpture? How are you composing painter? How are you applying the, the paint down? You know, so like I was talking to an artist at RISD yesterday and um, young painter, and they were asking me like, you know, what can I do to improve? And I'm like, try out different brush strokes. Because mm. I'm looking at these strokes that you're making and like, it doesn't do anything for me and it doesn't feel like you. And you also don't see the confidence. When a painter is like approaching mastery, there's a confidence in that mark, right? And so one thing that I encourage them to do is to draw more, you know, because I think when your line gets, you know, affirmed and confident, then that seeps into your painting. Material, are you manipulating material in a way that I haven't seen? So I think about like Hugo McLeod, who's an artist I've been collaborating with for almost a decade. And, you know, the first set of paintings that we showed in 2012 were made from roofing tar, you know, and, you know, brass and nickel that you use to, like, you know, metal that was dipped into, like, um, I think nickel that you use for cars or something like that. Mm. You know, in the beginning, it was a little bit rough because people didn't quite grasp it. And, you know, because he didn't fit the pedigree, didn't go to set art school, you know, his art school was School of Hard Knocks. It took some time, but I think he's finally, you know, over the last couple of years, definitely gotten some traction. But there was something about what he was doing that I was like, this dude's got the tools. You know, you can't always explain it. So I've been luckily right more than I've been wrong. So what's next for you? That's a good question. <laughs> Co-curating the Athens Biennale next spring which is kind of interesting because it was like bucket list before 45. It okay. came a little early. A half a decade early, man. That's pretty good. Yeah. And so collaborating with Om Social Club to co-organize the Athens Biennale. Greece is a place I've had an opportunity to spend a lot of time the last three years. People joke it's a second home and there definitely is a familiarity and a comfort there. Doing an exhibition with Amber Robles Gordon, um, who's an artist, Afro Puerto Rican artist based in DC. We'll do that next fall uh, at American University. And then I'm doing a group show in Rome. The one that was supposed to be in May, it's been pushed to November at Anamar Contemporary. And that's going to be super cool. Yeah, those are the main things. And I think with Art Noir, like really just pushing this fund. Um, so the fund will, it's on a rolling, um, application basis It's $500. It's a micro grant, you know, um, that can help with materials, groceries is unrestricted, yep. whatever the artist chooses to use it for. And the goal is to be able to disseminate these funds until the end of the year. Um, so outside of the auction, people can directly donate and, you know, we'll be A-B testing and tweaking and, yeah. and really trying to get a sense of who's like significantly in need. And then thinking about a book project. Um, Larry, Larry, you're making me feel like I'm not doing anything right now. No. You got, <laughs> I just, you got a lot. No, it's good. It's, this is like what you're saying, like, is like all this stuff that you're talking about. It's like, you can still do stuff no matter like, <laughs> like just because of pandemic, like just keep doing, I don't know, just keep doing and that's like, I, I, it's inspiring. But the thing is like, just make sure you're being intentional with it and you're not yeah. doing it for busy work. But I love the idea what you just said about testing things too. Like the first time you try something, like it might not work exactly, like, it might not work exactly the way you think it is, but just if you think that your vision's right, keep testing it, trying a little different parts of it. You know, like you can, you can make things happen that way. Yeah, I mean, I'm a big proponent of like, Seth Godin's hypothesizing or just ship it. You know, like I think I'm not someone that's going to overanalyze is this perfect? Because right. you're doing it. So I also talk a lot to artists about 
Mamba mentality. You know, rest in peace, Kobe Bryant. Absolutely. And like this notion of repetition and building the muscle memory where like when you put in a scenario, you know exactly what you got to do. But how do you make this different? How do you make it fresh? How do you make it resonant? So I don't got to overthink like the minutia. And I can kind of look at something and just be like, okay, this is correct. This is wrong. This isn't blah, 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 blah. But I think COVID has also taught me the importance of self-care and slowing down. Yeah. Right. And not constantly being busy and creating boundaries. And um, I've been blessed to be in a position to say no to things. Um, but I'm also conscious in that saying no, that I need to pay that forward. You know, so just kind of like this reciprocity. So like, you know, people will ask me to, you know, write about something or like moderate a panel. And, you know, for me, it's just always kind of this check and balance opportunity cost. And if I don't do it, you know, I've got a list of 10 people who I can be like, you know, these people will all be great. I can't do it. I don't have time. I can't give this mental space, you know, because like when you're working at the pace that I have worked, you're always kind of half paying attention. Right. And I'm sure yeah. you know, no, it's just sure. multitasking. Absolutely. And you don't really give it full focus until you're like the shot clock is running and it's like, okay, I got three months to finish this. And like, you're half paying attention to get it to that point. And I realize that that's not healthy. Um, so really kind of like, that's why like, even with the shows, you know, all the shows next year have been the shows that were supposed to happen this year that got pushed. And so making sure I'm spreading things out, you know, having time to be, you know, I used to call myself a flaneur. So this, I, this, this time to just kind of ponder, you know, I don't have like a bucket list of shows. It's like, it literally could be coming from talking to you both and you say, you know, mayonnaise. And I'm like, oh. Wow. I know like five artists who work with mayonnaise. Did you just look at us and think mayonnaise? No. <laughs> <laughs> is, is that what just happened? This, I was looking at this jar. I so this this jar that has my 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 smoothie used to have mayonnaise in it. Yeah. And I, I didn't want to say beet juice. <laughs> <laughs> I I, I you know, I, Even I wasn't. I know some artists making drawings with B. Die, which yeah. is kind of cool. There you go. That was some real perspective on the art model from Larry today. I hope any of you next gen curators were all scribbling down notes, getting ready to change things up even further. As always, thank you to every single one of you for listening. More importantly, Thank you to all of you that have made it this far in the episode. We appreciate your support. Please look after yourselves. Look after each other. Peace.